Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman, and welcome to another episode of The Last Frame Live. As always, I'll do a little photo news tonight, real little. Uh, I'll do a shot breakdown, and uh, it'll be the cover image that you saw online, and of course, we'll do The Last Frame Q&A. So if you're here, start typing. How can I help you? I'll do my best to answer all of your questions in the next 60 minutes. And if you're watching the replay, do me a favor, leave me a little note in the chat, let me know who you are and where you're watching from. But if you're here live, you know the drill, go ahead and leave me a message in the chat, let me know you're here and where you're from. Already, let's see, we got Calvin here uh, up in Maine, Ty in New Jersey, uh, Cooley's here, David in San Diego, Robert in New Mexico, Lynn in New York. All right, as always, gang, it's great to see you. All of you are part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I will work really hard to help you with your photography tonight. You know the drill. It would help a lot more people find out about The Last Frame. If you could do me a solid, hit that thumbs up below the video. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends the show to other photographers. And of course, while you're down there, you can feel free to hit that share button. Let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. Twitter, Facebook, they're usually the best way and the fastest way to get the word out. So uh, the good news is there's not really a lot of big news, at least not news that I feel is worth talking about. You know, there's some simple gear stuff, but nothing particularly fancy. Uh, I figured I would share, since I seem to be on this uh, theme lately of sharing with you contest winners in the hopes that more of you will put in a little bit of effort and kind of really look at these images and, and try and formulate your own opinions of what makes these images work, right? What makes them special? What makes them winners? So uh, this week we had the 2023 Underwater Photographer of the Year competition. Uh, winners were announced. And the winning images hold very true to the same information that I've been feeding you from the Sony Awards and the Travel Photographer of the Year Awards that I've shown you over the last few weeks. And you notice if we scroll through these images, there is a simplicity in the subject matter. There's not a lot of confusion. The subjects really jump out. They're clean. The colors are bold. The colors are eye-grabbing. They grab your attention. Um, you know, a story, or an image like this, there's not a clear subject matter in this image, but there's this kind of mystical storyline. And you notice how the lines and the composition kind of pulls you right up to the sun. Really, really well done. But all these others, I mean, really, really fascinating. This shallow water view with the, the manta rays. Um, I'm not sure about this one. I think this is a picture of Rihanna's backup dancers, either before or after the Super Bowl performance. I'm not sure, but I'll probably get in trouble for that. I know. Anyway, so take a look through. Again, it doesn't matter if you don't shoot underwater. I don't do underwater stuff. I'm not that good a swimmer. I'm not a water person, right? But you see the same kinds of elements in these images that are winning the contest. And look, they're winning the contest because they're great images, right? It, it's just that simple. That's why they're winning, okay? A um, couple of quick heads up, as always, just to bring you up to date with what's coming up. We're like two and a half weeks away, uh, WPPI. Las Vegas, I'm looking forward to it. I'll be there March 5th through the 7th, but the show goes till the 9th. And on Monday the 6th, I'll be doing a photo walk at the Mirage Hotel. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that already, you missed it. It's sold out. Sorry. Uh, but I will share this link with you. You can, if you have not signed up yet for WPPI, there's a couple really, really big deals going on this year. Number one, they've completely lowered the price. You can do the full conference. That means all the classes, everything except the photo walks. The photo walks you pay extra for, but you do everything for $99, right? Uh, you can get a trade show pass for free. So check that out. The link is um, in the chat there for you. 
uh, if you're going to be there, I hope to see you. Uh, Danny, you say yes, you'll be there. Awesome. I hope to see you. Uh, Danny, did you sign up for my photo walk? Are you coming on the photo walk? Um, because if not, Danny, I may ask a favor of you Monday before the photo walk. So I'll reach out to you about that. All right. Uh, some other stuff that I have coming up just to keep you guys up to speed on all of it. Uh, the middle of March. So there's a couple weeks after WPPI. I'm going down to Austin, Texas. I'm going to be there on a Friday and a Saturday on the Friday evening at Precision Camera, one of the coolest camera stores ever. Uh, I'm going to be doing a mastering creativity class, how to make interesting photos. So here's the trick, right? Uh, I'm also doing this class uh, or a similar class to this tomorrow night online. So if you're in Austin, Texas, don't pay to take it online. Just show up at Precision Camera because they're paying me to come there and teach that class for free. You can attend that one attend that one for free. And then the very next day, Saturday afternoon, this is March 18th. Uh, ooh, got a whole bunch of pop-ups there. Let's get rid of the pop-ups. There we go. Uh, I'm going to be doing an event with Sony and Nanlite, and I think Tamron's going to be involved, uh, and Precision Camera, and we get to take over the Q2 Stadium, which is the soccer stadium in Austin, Texas. We get the whole stadium to ourselves with a bunch of loaner gear, a bunch of lighting, and a group of models. And we get to shoot anywhere in the stadium. It's going to be really, really cool. So I'll be doing uh, a demo kind of tutorial thing uh, there before everybody gets started. And then I will be there to help and assist and coach people. And we're going to do some really cool creative stuff. And then also back in Texas in April, this is the big one. And I'm, I'm telling you, if you're going to, if you're going to attend any event of mine this year, if there's any way, and, and you know, I realize for most of you, this would mean like using your vacation to do it because it's a week, it's a whole week, but this is an opportunity to learn from me for five straight days. So the way Texas school works, they've got this amazing group of instructors and classes lined up. But when you sign up, you pick your instructor. You spend the entire week with that instructor, right? So it's Monday through Friday. Friday's a half day, but you spend the whole week. So for me, it's basically a deep dive into everything that I do with the theme being do different, be different, and create images that stand out. So we're going to be talking about portrait work. We're going to be talking about lighting. We're going to be talking about styling. We're going to be doing post-production and retouching. We're going to talk about marketing and business, all of it. So that's a full week. And here's the crazy part. You can attend that for just $750. That's all they charge. You're not going to find a week's worth of instruction like that anywhere for $750. So food for thought, check it out. If you have the opportunity, it is a great opportunity. Uh, I know there's still a couple seats left in that class, so you can still get yourself into that, okay? All right, so let me just clear all those out here. That takes care of all of my class stuff that I wanted to share with you. And, you know, let's go ahead and I'll do the shop breakdown next. And then I see already there's, there's one or two good questions in here. Let's get some more, okay? Josh, I saw yours. We'll, we'll get yours. Um, so the cover shot is, let me switch this over. Um, this one's slightly different than what's on the cover, by the way. Full disclosure, I, I loaded the wrong file into the template. But it's basically the same thing, right? Lighting's the same. Everything's pretty much set up the same. But I realized after I did it, it's like, oh, wait. I loaded, I loaded a vertical file in instead of the horizontal file. And the horizontal file is the one that I use. So let me talk about that right out of the box. I frequently, I shouldn't say frequently, but lately I've been getting asked a lot more from people like, hey, I notice all of your pictures are horizontal. And I notice like all of your pictures fit like in a 16 by nine format, like video format. Um, so technically all of my pictures aren't horizontal. Do I make it a rule to automatically shoot everything horizontal? Uh, no, I don't. For probably the last six or seven years, the overwhelming majority of what I shoot tends to be horizontal, just kind of instinctively. How did that happen? It happened because obviously once I started doing the YouTube stuff, which was like nine years ago, all of my work, pretty much all of my work was going into a video. 
I'm not going to lie. I hate, you know, the video where you get like the black edges or, you know, you just kind of, you put a, a separate layer of the image and then you blur it out to fill up the background with some texture. I, to me, that's just kind of awkward, right? And plus, we look at the world horizontally, right? So I am by no means saying, oh, you should be taking every, every picture horizontal. So I don't want anybody coming back at me with that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just explaining that, yeah, I've gotten to the point where I tend to do a lot of my work horizontal. I just I kind of see that way, right? Um, so it's not the only thing I shoot. It's not the only way that I shoot. But I will say the other thing that I enjoy about that, when I was a kid and I learned portrait photography and my first mentors, they were portrait photographers. They had a portrait studio in town. And I was taught a, a pretty hard, fast rule. And that rule was people are vertical, portraits are vertical. Done. End of conversation. You know, and that's, that's the same time period where we were taught that you, you photograph looking down on a woman because if they lift their eyes up, it makes their eyes look bigger. And you photograph looking up at a man to put them in a position of prominence. That's how I was taught. Uh, obviously, I would not recommend that as a working methodology for anyone today, right? Um, the overwhelming majority of my portraiture, uh, it doesn't matter if I'm photographing male or female, I am going to be somewhere between the nose and the mouth in terms of my camera height. So I am always looking up slightly at the eyes. It's a, it's a power position, right? Uh, if I'm doing a glamour shoot and it's meant to be kind of sexy or seductive, sure, I'll still shoot down on a woman and have her look up to give me the extra space underneath the eyes. It's a great technique, still has the same impact, right? But especially for business and headshots and things like that, uh, those old school rules definitely do not apply. So, as far as the, the whole horizontal thing, it's literally just something that's kind of evolved, but now you understand how to evolve. I didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm just going to start shooting everything horizontal. Uh, I will admit it's kind of my go-to thing now, but if something looks better vertically, I shoot it vertically. Uh, when I created the template for today's um, cover for the last frame, I honestly forgot that I had the horizontal one, grabbed the vertical one, and threw it in there and that's why. So slight difference, very little, right? Basically, this is a three light setup that honestly, it really could have been done with two lights. So in my finished image here, I have added, uh, again, some overlay. You see me do that a lot. I like that effect, working with the solid color backgrounds, creating usually a glow to get some light depth in that background and then I'll add some texture or other things and I do it in a way frequently and this is a great example where you, you can't really tell um, what or or why I used what's there uh, in this case and I apologize I didn't pull the files but they'll be in the social media post I actually used a kind of peeling paint chip texture and dust with light streaming through it. So it's two files dropped on top of each other, blended down, blurred. So obviously you don't see any of what I just described to you on that background. And that's the point, right? I don't want it, most of the time, I don't want it to look like I added a chipped paint texture or uh, dust with light streaming through it that becomes almost another element that is recognizable. Hence, it kind of becomes like another subject in the image. And I don't want that. Um, literally, what I'm doing is I'm just simply filling some negative space. And by the way, it's also worth pointing out, one of the benefits that I get, if you want to call it a benefit, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to encourage any of you to do this. I'm just, this is why I do it, since people ask. One of the benefits are this image, it's a large enough file, I could crop it vertically and it could essentially be like a magazine cover. I have plenty of pixels to do so. I could crop it square and it will look great on Instagram. 
I can keep it horizontal and use it as uh, a timeline cover on Facebook or you know almost any other kind of scenario. So uh, even if I needed to make like an eight by ten print, I basically would crop from the negative space over here to get the eight by ten print. Instead of cropping off like a little bit at each end, I'd you know crop right in around here and I would have my eight by 10 print. And certainly I could crop in a little if I wanted and shift it over, but uh, it's actually a way of shooting. It gives me a lot of flexibility with these studio images. Um, and, and if any of you are finding that confusing, let me know, or if you're watching later, leave me know in the comments and, and I'll gladly do a breakdown on it in one of the upcoming episodes of The Last Frame because I, I, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's something that I didn't set out to do, but it's really kind of become my working MO that it honestly gives me a ton of versatility. And by the way, I was doing this even when I was shooting with Olympus. So with the micro four thirds, 20 megapixel files, I was still, I, I had magazine covers that were printed from horizontally shot fashion portraits, right? So there's plenty of image to be able to do it. So this isn't one of those shoot loose, and crop it later situations. No, I'm shooting it for the horizontal display, but that gives me enough to work with vertically, square, eight by 10, 11 by 14. I could take pretty much any of those formats and work with that. So it, it actually builds in a, a lot of versatility, okay? So the setup for this, let me go ahead and switch my display over here. Uh, it's pretty simple, it's a three light setup. Um, unfortunately, there was no way for me to recreate all that tool and wrap it around her head, but I can show you exactly how the lights were set up. Uh, the key light is a 33-inch um, round box above the camera. You can see the catch lights uh, in the subject's eyes, pretty much just a little bit off to camera right, um, or excuse me, camera left, my apologies, okay? Um, I've got a background light on camera left that's putting a little bit of that pink glow and I've got a rim light on camera right that's giving me a little bit of the glow and just like I showed you last week let me go to a top view of this here okay uh, all of this can be done in a 10 foot diameter circle right so it's not a situation where you've got to have tons and tons of space to shoot these kind of shots, right? So food for thought. Um, I will add the links to the description below the video. If you want to be able to see the full res file, it'll be on my Flickr profile. Um, and then on uh, Facebook, I'll be, or excuse me, Instagram uh, tomorrow, I'll be adding the um, gear list lighting diagrams and, and all that kind of stuff. So you'll be able to check that out there. Okay. All right. So that is our shot breakdown. I am going to close that one out. And I saw we had at least one or two questions in here. Josh asked, and gang, seriously, if you're here, um, start typing. Otherwise, this will be a really short show. Okay. Uh, let me get rid of that. All right, Josh, your question. If the floor, the walls, and the blinds, etc., in my studio are gray, do you think it's all right if my ceiling is white? Um, well, Josh, I actually want to turn the question around on you. So um, I will give you an opportunity to respond, okay? So I have two questions. Number one, the first question I have for you is, with regards to the white ceiling, why do you think it's not a good idea? Well, otherwise, you wouldn't be asking me the question, right? And then the second question I have, so I want to answer them both at the same time is, um, what are the basic dimensions? You don't have to run and measure it with a tape measure, but I'd like to know the length, the width, and the ceiling height in the studio space that you're shooting. Because there's not a, a simple cut and dry answer like a yes or no. So if you give me that information, why do you think it may be a problem? And then what are the dimensions? Length, width, ceiling height. I'll give you a breakdown that kind of covers a lot of your options and things that I would encourage you to think about as you make that decision, okay? Um, also, Josh asked me, uh, did I use a fast aperture for that shot? 
Um, you're kind of mixing metaphors there, Josh. Uh, apertures aren't fast. Apertures are big or small, right? Shutter speeds are fast or slow. Um, I did not use a wide aperture. I shoot, when I'm in this studio, I shoot 99% of my stuff at f7.1 or f8. Those are my go-to apertures because there's no reason to do, if you look at my work, there's no reason for me to shoot at any other aperture. There's no benefit, right? Um, I am not a fan, let's just be clear, I'm not a fan of studio portraits where like the eyes are sharp, but the ears and the back of the head and the shoulders are blurry. It's just not my thing. Some people love it, and that's cool if that's their thing. Uh, it's not my thing, right? So um, for me, 7.1 f8, right in the middle of the, the, the range, that's how I shoot um, all my stuff in the studio, right? And then from um, a shutter speed standpoint, I am always at the maximum sync speed of my camera, which is a 250 to the second, unless I'm doing light painting or shutter drag or those kinds of things, which would you know, be for a special effect, okay? Um, Josh, his question here is, or his answer to the studio situation, it's roughly 15 by 13 with eight foot ceilings. His concern is with his ability to control the lighting, uh, bouncing around and painting the ceiling is a pain in the butt. Yeah, so um, you're right about the concern, okay? In a small space like that, you are going to get light that's going to bounce off the ceiling. However, you can also take advantage of that. So my studio space, which the video is on my YouTube channel, it's 20, just over 26 feet in running length, 13 feet wide in the shooting area, and the ceiling is just under 8 feet, right? It's about 7, 7 foot 10, some, 7 foot 9, something like that, okay? So it's a low ceiling. Uh, currently, because it's about to change, currently the room is completely white. It has been completely white walls and ceiling for the last 10 years. That's how long I've lived in this home. Um, my game plan when I set that studio up, when we moved into the house, which is how I've used that studio, was to actually use the walls and the ceiling as part of my uh, lighting regimen, meaning I would use them as reflectors. I would shoot with bounce. I've done many, many, many corporate headshots and acting headshots with bounce flash and a reflector with that nice low ceiling and super clean lighting, awesome, okay? So um, that being said, and I've you know done stuff where I've bounced off the walls, et cetera. That being said, the flip side of that is I've also never had a situation where I couldn't control the light with those white walls on white ceiling with the modifiers that I'm using, right? And no, I don't use grids. Almost never, right? It's simply about light placement. It's about angling. It's about, you know, you look at my diagrams, right? My The front of my modifier is usually about three and a half to four feet from my subject, right? So part of that is also factoring in, well, okay, so if I'm aiming a modifier down at my subject, how much of that light is going to be able to spill, hit the ceiling, travel to my subject, and how much fall off is there going to be? In other words, is there going to be enough light left from that bounce to impact my shot in any way? I have not run into a problem with that. Now, that being said, I am in the process of over the course of the last year, so it's a slow process. I'll, I'll own it, but uh, I've sold off a ton of gear because I've collected a ton of gear and for those years when I was doing all the sponsored stuff, you know, companies are sending you stuff like crazy. I know it's a rough problem to have, right? But the worst part of it is, is you, you get all this stuff and then, of course, companies expect you to use it and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm done. So you all know I dropped all my sponsorships last year and realized like I need to get rid of this stuff. So I've given away a lot of it. I sold the stuff that I purchased and now I'm getting my studio down to kind of a really streamlined setup that, that I'm really enjoying and it's working very well for me. So that being said... I am actually about to paint 
the ceiling half and half. I'm going to leave half of the room, remember it's 27 feet long, 26 and change. I'm going to leave half of the room white on the top, half of the room um, um, black on the top. Because I found myself in the last couple of months playing around with a little bit more dramatic lighting than I usually have done in the past. And I'm kind of having some fun with it. Like the image that I, sh I showed you guys last last week, a little bit grittier, uh, a little bit more shadow to it. Uh, I don't think you'll ever see me go kind of really dark and moody. That's just not my thing. But I have been getting a little bit grittier with it. So I want to make it a little bit easier when I'm doing those kind of shots to not have to worry about that bounce. So I'm actually going to split the room. But my room, Sean, is a, or Josh, is a dedicated room, right? So indeed, um, you know, if your wife is also looking at the idea that, hey, this room is in your house, uh, I would encourage you to work with the white and learn the inverse square law, Josh. That's the key, right? Work with the inverse square law. You're going to be able to manage your lights. Um, you know, sometimes you may have to flag some light. Um, depending on exactly what your setup is, you know, grids... Grids are not evil, um, depending on your setup, but don't think that the go-to solution is grids. It's not. Grids completely change the quality of the light. So you should use a grid based on what it's going to make the light look like first. If you just need to keep light off of a background or a subject, flag it. Don't grid it. Because the problem is the grid's going to change the light quality on your subject. So it's, it's, got, it's got two things that happen, right? So if the reason you're putting the grid on is just because you don't want light to hit the background, I would argue you're doing it wrong. Now, I said I would argue. There are some photographers that that's their go-to, right? If, if they need to keep light off the background, they're going to stick a grid on it. I don't feel that's the right way to do it. I, I, because the one thing that you can't argue and can't debate the minute you put the grid on, it changes the quality of light coming out of your modifier. If you like that light, then good for you. Use the grid. For me, I don't. If you look at my work, I have, you know, underneath all of my crazy creativity, I have really kind of a very commercial feel to my lighting. I like lighting that is flattering. I don't use a lot of hard shadows. So that's my personal style taste. Right, so that's part of what drives that, you know, goal of not putting a grid on because I don't want the harsher light. I use my big modifiers because I want that light soft. Putting a grid on defeats that. So I'd rather flag light from a background if that's what I need to do. Okay, so uh, Josh, tell your wife that uh, she can thank me later. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to work backwards for these questions here, guys. I see some good ones that came in. You guys are on it tonight. You had me worried there for a minute. Uh, Kevin, do you have a current photo light that you like? You probably have multiple. I seem to recall one called the Honey Badger a while back. Uh, that was like something along those lines. Yeah, I was using the Honey Badger for quite a while. They were great. Um, so uh, current photo light, uh, basically I use two different lights. Um, so, and I've been using two different lights for a really long time now. The only reason I moved away from the honey badgers, nothing wrong with the honey badgers at all. Uh, I stopped using the honey badgers before they came out with the honey badger unleashed, which is the one that works on a battery, right? Um, I started traveling when I became an Olympus visionary. You, you can't travel with strobes that size. They're just too big and they're too heavy to do that, right? Especially if you, I were to go with the unleashed one so that they're battery operated. So it made sense for me to look at Godox at that point, and that's what I did. And I switched over to the Godox line because I can travel with a, a suitcase that can be checked on a plane without paying any oversize or overweight fees. And I have a video on, on my YouTube channel about that setup. I can travel with a, a four-light studio. So four Godox 8200s with both the Fresnel heads and the bare bulb heads, four light stands, two modifiers, a full suite of magma gels and accessories like the grids, the holders, the snoots, all that kind of stuff. Uh, my tether cables, um, triggers for every camera brand because when I'm teaching workshops, everybody needs to be able to shoot. 
right? And I can fit that all in one suitcase. I wouldn't be able to do that with uh, the interfit lights. And then if I'm working with LEDs, Kevin, to answer the rest of your question, um, the Stella Pros are, are what I use. Um, my favorite of the lights of what I have from Stella Pro, definitely the CLX-10. Uh, if I need small and I'm traveling, it'll be the Reflex. But the new one that they have, and I don't remember the model number, they have a, a new one that's super powerful and looks like it's really tiny. Uh, it does not have the digital burst like the Reflex. So this would be kind of a downsized version of the CLX-10. Uh, but yeah, it looks like a really sweet light. It's also less expensive than the CLX-10. Part of what makes the CLX-10 so expensive is that it's weather sealed, the battery is built in, and it is not a changeable battery. It's, it's a rechargeable battery, but you can't swap the batteries out. Uh, and that that is kind of a feature deficit for a lot of photographers. So the new one allows you to swap out USB bricks and power it. So it's a little bit more versatile in that respect. Okay. Um, let's see. Steven, I own a Sony A7C. And I'm finding it very difficult to track focus on a running dog. Any suggestions? Well, so um, a, a couple things, Stephen. So first of all, I'm not going to lie to you. I am not familiar with the A7C. Uh, I, I'm a Sony user, but I'm not a Sony ambassador, so I'm under no obligation to really know anything about Sony cameras, and I don't. Uh, oh, okay, so this is this is kind of like the newer version of the 6500, right? Is that it? Um, so here's the bottom line. Uh, without even reading the specs, you're expecting, and I'm making an assumption, so feel free to correct me and let's add more information here, but from your question and the way you've worded it, it sounds like you're expecting too much out of your camera. Back before we had autofocus, you know, back in the dark ages, because uh, I am that old, I remember those days. Um, back before we had tracking and all that kind of stuff, you had to do manual focus, right? Now, if you did a lot of sports, which I did when I was a newspaper photographer, um, I literally would practice. In fact, when I was a teenager, so here, here's how much of a nerd I am. You guys think I talk about practice just like to bully you. I would come home from high school at the end of a school day. I had a dark room. My father helped me build a dark room in the basement of our house. I would go into the dark room, and back in the day, you could buy film, Tri-X black and white film, in 100-foot rolls. The roll was about that big around in the box, right? So it was 100 feet of Tri-X. And then you would put this into a gadget called a bulk film loader, and you could load your own rolls of film. You had reusable film cartridges and the whole bit. So I would come home from film from school every day, as long as the weather was okay. And I would load one 36 exposure roll of Tri-X black and white film into my camera. Now, I had just gotten my first motor drive. I had a Nikon F with a motor drive. And I think they were like all of like maybe two frames a second, if that. Um, so anyway, I would go out, walk down to the corner of my street that I lived on. I lived on a, a rather quiet residential street. But down at the corner, that was a much busier road. And I would sit on the curb. And I had my 200 millimeter lens, which for me as a teenager, that was like, that was a big lens. And I was learning to shoot football with it. And I would practice follow focus. So to my left, when I sat at that corner, about 150 yards down the road was an even bigger intersection. So what would happen, cars would turn that corner and then they would be accelerating as they go past me. So my goal was to keep the front passenger side bumper of the car in focus as it came towards me, traveled past me and kept going. And I would practice that car after car after car for about 35, 40 minutes. And then I would just randomly pick a time and say, okay, it's time. Load the roll of film into the camera and the very next car, I had to shoot the entire roll of film. So the car would come around the corner. As soon as that car was getting close enough to start to make a picture that filled the frame, I would start shooting, focusing on the front passenger corner bumper of the car, because back then cars had bumpers. And I'd follow it past me as it went up the road. Then I'd go home. I'd go down in the dark room. I'd develop that roll of film. I never printed them, but here's how much of a nerd I was. I had a clipboard hanging on the wall. 
and I had made a chart with a ruler. And each day after I developed that film and dried it, I would put it on a light table with a loop and I would go frame by frame. And I kept a record of how many frames that I have that were tack sharp so that I could see what my progress was with the goal being to get to 36. Now, how does that help you today since I've just told you this old story? Well, the fact of the matter is you want the camera to do all the work. Even my newer, bigger Sonys, like the, the, A7, uh, the A7 IV, which awesome camera, and let me tell you, the tracking, it's incredible. Would I trust it if I wanted to photograph a dog running to do all the work? Never. So the best thing that you can do if you really want to get great shots, because understand too, if you're just expecting that, you know, you're going to have a dog running randomly and you're just going to chase it around and get pictures, they're going to be crap pictures. They, they just are. Because now you're also throwing in the fact that you're probably going to use a telephoto lens and they're going to have compositional issues. Like, are you going to be able to keep the dog framed properly? All that. Like, why make a job harder than it needs to be? period. So what you do, let's say you've got the, you know a dog that likes to run and you're out on the trail on a path. Find something for the dog. I'm just giving you one example. Find something for the dog to jump over and then have someone take the dog down the path. And what you're going to do is you're going to focus on the top of that. Say it's a log. You're going to focus on the top of that log, right? And you're going to let that dog come running at you and you only need one frame. You're going to get one frame of that dog in midair as its face comes up over the top of that log. Boom. Why do you need 10 frames of that? Why do you need four frames of that? If you build the technique, you can do it in one frame. Um, just so you all know, I, I can't give you all the details tonight, so you'll have to take my word on it, but I'll tell you more over the next two weeks. While I'm in Vegas, I am going to be shooting a YouTube video, not for my channel, but of course I will share it with all of you. Um, and the task is going to be to shoot action, a model in action. So not quite as fast as a dog, but a model in action, but no tracking autofocus, no spray and pray, multiple frames. We're gonna do it one frame at a time. That's the challenge that I'm being given to do. Um, so. You know, I'll put my actions where where my you know my words are with that. But uh, you're just expecting a little bit too much from a camera like that. Um, you need to learn to pre-plan points, locations, photograph the dog as it hits those locations, and you can still do amazing action images that way. Make sure you're working at a very fast shutter speed. So if the dog's in the air, you're stopping the action, uh, etc. Okay, that's how you're gonna want to. Um, want to approach that, okay? All right, uh, scrolling back up here. Uh, Cooley, is it true that using a smaller aperture you're using the better part of the glass of the lens? Um, not, not as much in today's world, but yes, historically, the center part of the lens, right? F7, F8 is usually the sharpest piece of the lens. Technically, that still applies today, but lenses are so much better. I, you know, I, I don't have any statistical facts that I can give you. But in my experience, you know, all these discussions we see, you know, it's, it's like the megapixel discussion. All these discussions that we see about, you know, how sharp is this lens on the corners and how sharp is this lens here? Yeah, if you bench test it, there's a difference. But in terms of what you're ever going to see in your photography, and especially on social media, there's no damn difference at all. I mean, you know, part of my choice in going with Tamron lenses, which I'm still, to this day, no regrets. I, I, it was one of the smartest decisions I've ever made gear-wise, ever, in my career. You've all heard me talk about the fact that I didn't want to spend the money on Sony lenses. I, 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 I'm very happy with my Sony camera bodies. Sony lenses are big, obnoxious, and ridiculously expensive. I won't spend that kind of money, especially not on a lens that gives me a one-year warranty. So on a bench test... Is a Sony lens a little bit better than a Tamron lens? Some of them are a little bit better. Not all of them. But in terms of what I can see in my images, no, they're no better. In terms of what you're ever going to see on social media, are they any better? No, never. And those Tamron lenses, fraction of the cost, they weigh less, 
and they come with a six-year warranty. So here you have a company that's charging more, making them bigger, and they only put a one-year warranty behind their work. And then you have a company that's charging less and making them smaller, and they give you a six-year warranty behind the work. So, you know, you do the math, right? That's, that's kind of how I approach that. Um, Angela, have you ever designed a lookbook and how might one look for uh, a dog photographer to hand out um, to potential commercial clients at a trade show? Um, so there's a kind of a couple ways that you go about it, Angela. I, I have done lookbooks. Um, I'll be honest with you, I have not done a lookbook since the 1990s, right? So it's been a little while, but um, given the, the world that we live in today, you actually have a lot more options with a lookbook. Um, if you're doing a trade show, which I, you know, I would have to say to you, commercial clients at a trade show is potentially not your best plan. So let me come back to that, right? But let's do the trade show thing. Um, when people are at a trade show, business people, they're at a trade show, they're manning a booth, right? So they're there to meet customers and talk to customers, right? So they've also, when they travel, assuming that they had to get on a plane to go to that trade show, they've got suitcases and luggage and stuff. They don't want another book or for that matter, even a brochure. So I would actually encourage you, if you were going to do something like that, that you were going to hand out at trade shows, I would actually consider going to a company like photoflashdrive.com uh, and getting USB drives that have your logo printed on them and um, basically maybe put your, your lookbook together in PDF format, um, put it onto the USB drive, uh, include links to your website, all of your socials, and maybe like a message on there. Give them that drive, right? That's what I would do in that case. But the reason why I kind of balked at the trade show is that frequently the people at the trade show are, are not the decision makers, right? So for smaller vendors, yes, you'll, you'll have the actual decision. And it's the same in the photography industry. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter what the industry is. Believe me, it's the same. The bigger companies, the decision makers aren't there, right? They may be there for a couple hours during the trade show on one afternoon kind of thing, depending on where it is and how big a deal that show is in the industry. But in all likelihood, the decision makers are not there. So if you are looking to pick up commercial clients, Angela, and if you want to put together some really uh, unique marketing pieces, and if these companies, by the way, if these are bigger commercial companies, what I would actually encourage you to do, uh, and it's, it's not free, it's going to cost you a couple of bucks, but I would encourage you to go ahead and spend the 500 and some dollars for one year of LinkedIn Premium. By getting LinkedIn Premium, you have full access to anybody on LinkedIn. You know, the way LinkedIn works, like you have to know somebody to be able to send them a request or they have to be like, you know, a friend of a friend to send them a request. When you have LinkedIn Premium, you have full access to anyone. So then what you do is you search for all the, all the major companies in your industry that you're interested in. And then um, you can go and you can look at all their employees that have profiles. Any marketing people, they're going to have a profile on LinkedIn, right? And now you have the direct contact information to reach out to them and you can build it that way. So um, really kind of this depends on specifically what kind of companies you're going after and how big they are. Um, but I would be, for me, I would be reluctant to put my time and effort and print something that's really, really nice and then give it to somebody at a trade show. It's a really good likelihood it's going to hit the trash can before it even leaves the trade show hall. So that's the challenge that you you run into there. Your thought process about wanting to be able to meet people, put a face, that's actually a great idea. But make it easy for them to be able to transport um, the stuff back. Okay? So, all right. Let's see here. Going on back. Um, wow, you guys got a lot now. Angela used to shoot hockey with a Pentax K1000. Pentax K1000, I give Pentax a hard time. K1000 was a sweet little camera. It was about as simple and basic and easy as they come. Like, it was a great camera. Um, let's see here. Scrolling back. So, all right. So, that was that one. 
Um, Samuel, I have a space that is small and can't do the 10 foot diameter circle. My width is 11 feet, uh, length 25 feet. How would you do uh, a circle diameter if you can't do the 10 feet diameter? Um, so 11 feet is bigger than 10 feet. So am I missing something here? Um, you could make your circle eight feet in diameter, right? Um, none of these are rules. That whole 10 foot thing is just, it's a guideline, right? It's just a guideline. Um, you don't even have to have the circle. I show the circle to show people that basically, you know, if you've got a three dimensional human being and you think in terms of a circle, it actually makes it really easy to not only place, but move your lights. Um, that's just something that I started doing in the last year and a half to teach lighting. And it's great. It's actually super simple. Um, but I didn't, I didn't learn lighting that way. Uh, you could definitely work with, with a smaller uh, circle. What you may have to do is have an odd shaped circle, meaning, um, you know, you may have, uh, let's say a nine foot diameter circle, but every now and then you may need to move your key light out of that circle. But then understand if during a session you move the key light, you need to check your exposure at that point, right? The beauty of the 10 foot circle is, is that as long as you keep your lights on the 10 foot diameter, the exposure never changes. That's, that's, that's really the only thing about the circle, right? It prevents that kind of that mistake, right? Samuel, let me know if these, that helps. Um, let's see, Calvin, I teach black and white photography during the summer and we still love try it. So that type of film, load. Yeah, 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 you can still buy them. I've seen them. Uh, they're still around. Josh, have you explored any of the Godox LED offerings? And if so, do you have any opinions? Uh, no opinions, and I have not tried them yet. Uh, they're not ready for me. And here's why. It's super, super simple. Um, the reflex lights, wickedly expensive. That sucks. But it is what it is, right? But part of the reason why they're so expensive is they're super bright and super small. That's what makes them functional. The CX, CLX-10s, are only slightly bigger than a Godox 8200. The reflex light is about half the size of a Godox 8200. That's what makes them great. Um, Godox, Nanlite, Aperture, all those companies, great lighting options, but they're bigger, right? Um, and of course, for the longest while, they were AC only. They're starting to catch up now with the battery power. But if you're, in my opinion, just my opinion, for my method of working, if you're looking at an LED light that's battery powered and you've got to put like a DTAP battery on it or something, that defeats the purpose because DTAP batteries are massive and they're heavy, right? So the idea is you want, you know, small, lightweight, self-contained unit. One of the things that's nice about the reflex lights is I don't even use the, the battery handles on them. I mount the light right onto pole and I use USB bricks, which I can just strap onto a stand. And they're super simple. And then if that brick dies and needs to be recharged, you just slap out the brick, boom, keep going. So um, I, I love that flexibility, but they're more expensive. So you pay for that convenience. And the only reason I've purchased those lights at this point is not because I use them in the studio. I don't use them that often in the studio, but I use them a lot when I teach because that way when I'm teaching in person, people can see the light change as I move the light, they don't have to wait for me to take a picture and, um, you know, then, then see the result. So that's the biggest reason. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of options out there for LED lights and believe me over the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot and lot more. Um, we're getting closer and closer and closer every day for lights to be at, for LED lights to be like prime time lights, but it's never going to actually happen until photographers start using their mirrorless cameras the way that mirrorless cameras are really meant to be used, which I've had that conversation many times over, but yeah, it, you have to start, you have to start changing the way you think about ISO to make LED lights work if you're a portrait photographer, otherwise you're going to blind everybody that you photograph. So you, you need to be raising your ISO up, bringing the light power down. And that way you're creating a much nicer experience for your subject, right? And that's, that's the key. Okay. Um, let's see, where are we at here? Larry, I recently took a photo of my wife, ran into a problem. She has high cheekbones and the photograph looks as if she had a large bubble on her cheek. Uh, I did use 
flash to fill in the shadow. So Larry, obviously I can't see the picture and I don't know your lighting setup, but what that sounds like to me, it sounds like you saw some photographer on YouTube, not me, because I don't do it, that puts their modifier, like if this is the portrait subject's head, here, let me put it over there, they put their modifier like up above angled down. That's what that sounds like. So that it creates, if your wife has pronounced cheekbones, high cheekbones, it's going to create shadows underneath, which is going to actually make them look bigger, right? So the problem with that YouTube crap is it's very stylized. So it looks okay for some things, but it's actually not good universal portrait lighting. And the thing you have to understand about lighting, Larry, is that there's no one-size-fits-all. There, there is absolutely um, no one kind of light arrangement that you can use for everything. Otherwise, your photography is going to be photography is going to be really boring. But unfortunately, there's a lot of YouTubers that use that light. Like, oh, it's really cool, and everybody thinks, oh, that's how to set it because they set it like on top of their subject. Well, yeah, but they don't. When do you ever hear those YouTubers? When do you ever hear them talking about the facial features and the shape of the person's face and the do's and the do they don't, right? They just that's where they set their light and they got to take the pictures. So. All of that depends on your subject. If your wife has really high cheekbones, I would encourage you to get that light out in front and bring it a little bit lower and you're going to get much more flattering light because you don't need to do anything with your light that is going to um, uh, accentuate the cheekbones. Okay. Uh, Tom, seems that you're moving away from strobes and preferring continuous LED lighting. Uh, I am doing it more and more and more, but we're not 100% of the way there yet. Yeah, nothing's changed with that. I'm still using the LEDs as much as, as I was when uh, the reflex lights came out. Okay. Uh, Patrick, at work, the signal's really bad. Did you uh, answer the question about, oh, what mannequin would I recommend? I can find you a mannequin here. Uh, Patrick, I'll give you the link for my mannequin. There is a rule, though, Patrick, when you purchase a mannequin you have to um, you have to give her or, or him depending on which one you get you have to give them a name right it's a rule my mannequin's name is Lola okay so just make sure that you do that and give me just a second here and I'm gonna get you I'll get you the link to my mannequin there we go. Let me get rid of that. And here now. They change its location. Wow, look at that. She's like on sale. Your lucky day. $44. I'm jealous. I paid $70. Okay, so here, Patrick, here is. There you go. Okay. All right, there's your thing. Daniel, the clock method for teaching lighting is much easier to assimilate and put to use than uh, that 45 degrees. Um, so, Daniel, that's a bunch of crap. So let me explain, man. First of all, um, I'm not talking about a clock method at all, right? Uh, I am not talking about 45 degrees. Both are, are BS. Here's why. They establish the mentality that light should be at these positions. That's crap. So, sorry, but I won't tolerate that in my discussion. That's not how I teach light. This is my classroom. There are other people that live by that. There are other people that teach it. In my opinion, their work is boring and predictable. Very high quality, but boring and predictable. So, no. Okay, that's definitely not the way to go about it. If you have actually heard me talk about my system previously, Daniel, you would know that the purpose for the circle has nothing to do with pre-establishing lighting arrangements. Because seriously, anything that's pre-established sucks. That means you're going to repeat it over and over and over again. Where's the creativity? Where's the uniqueness? That's just boring. And you know what that is? That's lazy. The circle solves a beginner problem. The beginner problem of the photographer who starts photographing somebody does their test shots, get their exposure set, set up, and then moves the light and forgets to check the exposure after they do it. And they finish a session 
download their images, and realize that partway through the session, everything started being overexposed or underexposed. That's a problem. The 10 foot circle, if you go back and you watch the video that I did about it, also includes string. By tying a piece of string on the stand, making it five feet long or whatever diameter the circle is, half of that, all you have to do when you move your light, hand the end of the string to your subject, tell them to hold it at their chest when you move the light, keep that string taut and your exposure never changes. That's the point, okay? So, um, Josh, do I find fill light produces better uh, results than a reflector? Instead of better, should I say softer transitions and shadows? Uh, sorry, Josh, you're thinking about lighting. You, you, you want the perfect light before you've even tried playing with light. It doesn't work that way. Uh, I can make really, really soft transitions with a reflector. I can make really, really hard transitions with a reflector. I can make soft transitions with a light. I can make hard transitions with a light. You're, you're looking for the wrong approach. And I get it, this stuff's expensive and it's a little bit overwhelming when you start. You're trying to find like, what's the right tool so that I've got all the right tools and I'm done. So I don't have to spend any more money than I need to and I've got the right tools. No, work with the tools that you have and learn how to use them. And you'll be a better photographer for it, much better. Because you can buy all the right tools. Because let's face it, when you ask a, a photographer that question, Josh, honestly, what kind of answer can I give you? I can tell you what I use. That doesn't help you, right? That doesn't solve your problem. So the, the real answer is there's no experience, Josh. You're missing the key point. If you understood the inverse square law, you would not be asking me that question, right? That's the key. If you want to learn lighting and you want to get good at lighting, you have to learn the inverse square law. And I don't mean the equation. I don't even know the damn equation. I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you if my life depended on it, literally. But give me three hours and I still will not be able to show you everything that I can do with the inverse square law in three hours. That's the experience piece, right? So I understand it. And I understand how to use it as a tool, a very creative tool. It's a really, really powerful tool. So many photographers really screw themselves up by not truly understanding depth of field, by not truly understanding the inverse square law. And when I say understanding, it's not the definition. That's memory. Anybody can, anybody can remember a definition. Memory, understanding, two completely different parts of the brain. They're, they're not interchangeable, right? So I'm talking about understanding. Those are the two most powerful creative tools that a photographer has, and they are a gift from physics. A gift because they cost nothing. Like, wow. So instead of running out and buying gear, right, you can... Make it work with a reflector. You can make it work with your light, right? And so um, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. I'm telling you what the fact is, period. I can do it with a reflector. I can do it with a fill light. I can do it with a sheet. I can do it with anything. I can feather my key light. And depending on how much of a fill you want, I don't even need to fill. I can create a fill with a key light. Think about that. But you have to understand feathering. And that requires understanding the inverse square law. So it's not about opinion. It's simply about science. That's where the answer comes in. I hardly ever set up more lights than I need to. But now that I said that, let me talk out of the other side of my mouth. I'll also do pictures with 10 lights in the picture because I can and I feel like it. So it's really a matter of where's my creative thought process going and what's going to be the easiest way for me to get to the end goal. That's the way that I approach lighting. What is the path of least resistance? I'm not going to make it any harder than it needs to be, but I'm also not going to sacrifice quality in the process. Okay. All right, gang, seven o'clock, right on the button. So I've got to go teach a class. Uh, great conversation tonight. A lot of good topics that came up. Uh, we'll be back next week. Another shot breakdown. Uh, some more questions. I know there's one or two that I didn't get to. I'll save those. We'll hit those next week. 
In the meantime, gang, you know the drill. You've got less time ahead of you than you do behind you. So stop wasting your time. Go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot, gang. Adios. Take care.